Good evening. <clears throat> Another wonderful day. Uh, we're going to talk some today about input and output and how that all works. And uh, at least to start on that, we should be able to wrap it up. I'm thinking we can wrap it up uh, on Monday. Uh, maybe not, actually, now that I look back at the schedule here. It looks like there might be, we might be looking at uh, wrapping this up next Wednesday. So then, um, am I looking here? That's right, okay. Assignment 7 next week, then exam 2 will be the following Friday. Okay, um... All right, so I'm going to talk today about input and out output systems. But the first thing I want to do is actually, the, the, I don't know why it sticks it here, but it does. Uh, so we're kind of following the book. Eh, fair enough, right? So I'm going to talk about something called, oh, I, geez, I need to have my, uh, my OneNote open. Because otherwise it's just a blank page here. So let me get that open for you guys. There we go. Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. One note here. New. Lecture 22. All right. Hey, you guys get to see how the, the secret sauce, how everything's made now, huh? Eh, well, that's all right. I don't think that's a big deal. All right, so let's go ahead and... Gonna make some space for myself here. I'll add more if I need it. Okay. <clears throat> Alright, so one of the things is, so let me, let me just do this. It's something called Am's uh, Amdahl's Law. Okay, I not, might not pronou be pronouncing it right, but that's okay. So <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a way for somebody to look at this, uh, look at as a computer is getting better, uh, as they improve everything, right? So they'll improve some memory, or they'll improve the processor, or they'll prove, um, improve, uh, right, a better, a better hard drive, whatever it is, better motherboards, whatever it is, we're going to look at a way to kind of quantify that in how much uh, a something will speed up. It'll speed up the whole computer. Because everything is, is interplayed between each other. So here would be an example. Um, if I came out tomorrow with a brand new computer that had uh, a CPU that allowed for uh, 128 bits bit words, which is double what most computers are doing now. If I came out with that computer... There would be nothing that would, or they didn't have, I wouldn't have a bus, I wouldn't have anything else to, that would use it. So, <clears throat> I would just be in a position that it wouldn't actually do me much good. Um, the same could be true, right, if I developed something, uh, developed a new computer that supported, uh, or that had, uh, say, 64 cores on it, and I didn't have a program that allowed for that, right? It only allowed for up to 16. It wouldn't be able to do it. So, hang on, phone, <laughs> go away. All right, so, uh, uh, let me bring this up here. So, there's a way to kind of quantify this. If somebody came up with this uh, back, back in the 60s. So, I'll, I'll go ahead and put his name here. Um, Amdahl. Amdahl's law. And it's a way to quantify it, to say, you know, if I impre increase the hard drive disk, how much will that speed up my whole computer? I don't know that I really necessarily buy into it, but it certainly gives me this whole idea that it doesn't improve the whole thing, it only improves that component. And so we have to have a way to kind of figure out how that is. Okay, so let me give you the formula, and then we'll talk about how it's used. All right, so S 
equals one over one minus f plus f divided by k. All right, so now we have to tell what each of these is. So s is the speed up. F is fraction of work, so it's fraction, stands for fraction, fraction of work performed by the new faster component. So, uh, that formally that's what it is, but I'm going to give you a little bit different definition that's probably easier to understand. Fraction of time that that new thing is working, it's running. Okay? I'm going to say component. Is in use. And then K. the speed up of the component. And to help us remember this, oh, this is C speed up of system. I'm going to I'm going to say this component is a K so that we kind of think speed up of component. I know I'm misspelling it, but that's okay. All right. So let's try an, an example or two. All right. So let's say I get a new CPU. And the CPU this is never true probably. So uh, this is actually a, an interesting thing to do. Let's see if I can do that on my computer. If I can get it up for you guys. I do a control alt delete. Oh, geez, everything went away. But I got up my task manager. Now you can see all the stuff I have running. Uh, but what I want to look at is here. Actually, this is what I want to look at. So the CPU, my CPU on my computer is currently running at 17, 18%. It's basically doing nothing. Memory is running at 35%. The disk is running at 0% because I'm not actually writing or reading anything. My Ethernet and my graphics card. So this is actually kind of a neat little thing to watch. Um, and in fact, uh, it is important uh, because when you're doing working on bigger projects, like the project that I work on, when I have to do a build on that project, uh, and we use a, a piece of software, uh, a, a program to do that called GWT. Uh, but when I have to do a build, it basically maxes out. I'm, I'm working on a VDI, uh, which is like a virtual machine. It's a type of virtual machine. A, VDI is what? Virtual desktop environment. So it's uh, a virtual machine doesn't have to include everything, but a VDI does. So that, I think that's kind of the difference between the two. Anyways, I use, use a VDI, and it maxes out my VDI. So when I run that build for about 40 minutes. So I basically can't do anything. So uh, this is important. The good news is I very rarely have to do a build, like once every three months. But uh, so as a programmer, if you have to do a build and it takes that much time, well, you might, you know, a lot of our programmers, right, because I'm a tester, so... Uh, that most of our programmers are doing builds once or twice a day. And so they don't, they can't have the same speed of VDI. They have to, they have to get faster, 
ones. And they can increase memory to kind of help that out. Uh, but it is something that I've had to look at and had to use in my career. So, all right. So this is just kind of a way to look at this. It isn't going to show us what our CPU is doing. Or, but if I looked at this, right, I probably don't need to change anything. But because my, my computer is mostly resting, right? And in fact, actually, the vast majority of the time, when you're just using your computer, say you're going online or whatever, and just say you're browsing the internet, right? You're going to, it doesn't matter, your favorite websites. Unless you're streaming video, it, well, even if you're streaming video, because that doesn't take CPU time. So it's going to take Ethernet time, but it's not going to take CPU time. So that is, uh, the CPU is just largely sitting there just doing nothing. So even if you're playing something that feels like it's really intense, and it might be graphically intense, and so the GPU will go up and it'll work pretty hard, but the CPU won't necessarily, depending on what you're doing. So it's just an interesting thing to look at. You know, if you've got an extra monitor and next time you're playing, uh, playing, playing a game or something that's graphically intense, you might want to look at that. That's kind of an interesting thing to do. Okay. Is it completely related? Eh, nah, kind of, a little bit. Because part of the thing is, right, is that the computer thinks at such quick speeds in the nanosecond, billions of times per second. So, right, if, if in the last second it's only done a million things, well, then it's less than 1% less than utilization. It's not being used. So we wouldn't necessarily need to upgrade that most of the time. Which is why if, if all you're going to do is go on the internet and go play videos and, and you're never going to do any programming basically on your, on, your, uh, on your computer, you know, you can get a pretty stripped down computer. It doesn't need to be very fancy at all. It can be um, older or you could go for something small and light like a tablet or or like a you know a MacBook Air or I think they have some other kind of Air versions right where, where everything's much smaller and then you don't have as much functionality but that's okay because you're worried about you, you know most of the time you're not don't need it you're not using it um, I, I hope none of you are actually programming on a tablet that would unless you've got a really good tablet maybe that's that works all right, so all right, let's come back here and, and talk about this. Let's so let's just say for sake of exa an example, you know I've got a new processor, right? And so that processor uh, is is going to be being or the processor is being used, say I don't know eighty percent of the time. Okay, so I'm going to consider this processor. So it's being used. So F equals 80% or 0.8. And it'll always be a percentage or a, a, a decimal, a fraction. So F is always a fraction, right? That's part of the name. Okay, and let's say this brand new... Um, processor is five times faster. So then K will be equal to five because it's five times faster. Okay, so let's plug this all in. One minus, uh, well, let's go ahead. And, I'm just going to do the whole thing here. One minus 0.8. Put that in parentheses. Plus point, uh, point 0.8. I keep that point divided by five. All right, so let's go and let's just do the math. This is pretty pretty straightforward stuff. Just fractions. I think we learned this stuff maybe in elementary school, maybe middle school. So we say point two. The well, one minus point is point two. All right, so. Uh, 0.8 divided 
divided by 5 would be, well, we moved the decimal place over a couple times, and we're going to bring it back and we're done. So we're going to say 80, so that would be 16, so 0.16. Check that on calculator and make sure, but my guess is that's, I'm pretty sure that's correct. <laughs> so then I get 1 over 0.36. And now I am going to get out a calculator because, well, I'll get out my calculator and I'll do that. 0.8 divided by 5. See if your instructor got it right. Oh, look at that, he did. Hey, it happens every once in a while. Okay. All right. So now we say 1 divided by 0.36. It should be 2.78. Correct? Yeah, because I'll round up to two decimal places here. Okay. So that's not bad. But, well, wait a second, though. It said it was five times faster. But it's really only half of that. Even though it's 80% utilization, that's a pretty small difference. And that sucks. All right, let's do another example. Let me divide these out here. All right, so let's look and say, all right, well, um, I've got a chance to... to um, to increase my uh, my disk drive, right? And so, but that disk drive is only used 10% of the time, okay? So we'll go 10% equals 0.1. And the K, let's say it's... Um, Three times faster, which is actually really fast. <clears throat> That's a major improvement. Let's say it's not that much. Let's let's go differently. Let's go uh, let's go something more realistic. Say 1.5. So it's 50% faster. So it's, it be, goes from one to 1.5. Okay. So let's plug those numbers in. One over one minus point. 1 plus 0 0.1 divided by 1.5 equals, so this one is 0.9 here in that first spot. So, ooh, 0 0.1 divided by 1.5. Uh, well, let's use my calculator, right? 1 divided by 1.5. What's that going to be? That's going to be about like point, point, point zero six seven. Ah, there we go. All right, point zero, and I'm just going to put 7, though, because I round it to the nearest two decimal places. Okay. 1 divided by 0 0.97 1.03 so it sped up by 3% even though the memory is 50 times faster. It only increases my total speed by 3%. Because it's only used 10% of the time. And, and uh, I'm sure somebody spent a long time thinking about this. I'm guessing I know the person's name. But um, Amdahl. Uh, so, uh, and, and that just gives us a way to kind of do that. So make sure you review this. There's a couple other examples in the book or there'll be other examples online. So, M. Dahl's Law. 
I can pretty much guarantee it'll come up on an exam or a t or a assignment at least once. All right, so let me talk then a little bit about I.O. architectures. But first, uh, actually, I'm going to say I.O. subsystems. So I.O. In fact, actually, let me, there's going to be a lot of writing here. So let's go ahead and get my type box here. Click there. Change my this to 36. I think that's what we used before. Okay, so I O subsystems. And actually, we'll talk a little bit about why I differentiate between main memory and the hard drive, which is not memory in my mind, and it shouldn't be considered memory. And I think eventually you guys are going to get there um, that that is not memory. That a hard drive is not, a SST drive is not memory. And that's because both of those have to use, uh, have to use the I.O. subsystem. Because they're really an input-output device. A hard drive is an input-output device because it's not integrated, it's not directly connected to the CPU because it has to go through one of these, uh, go through some I.O. Okay? So... What are our different subsystems? And they're not in any particular order. So blocks of main memory. And, and, and I'll specify that a little bit more, that are devoted to the I.O. functions. Okay? Not all of our different architectures that we're going to talk about today are going to use these, but that certainly uh, is a possibility. Buses that provide transfer. So remember, a bus is right, that's the thing that connects two things uh, or more things. And we talked about buses before. I think, I don't think we're going to actually talk about how. How they work, although they're very, it's very, very fascinating because if you've got, well, I, t I think I talked about it before, right? If you've got four or five things that are all in the same hallway deciding who's going to get, who, whose turn it is to talk, it could be a little bit tricky, right? When people are sticking the heads out of their rooms deciding it's time to talk, uh, it can be tricky to decide who gets the, uh, who gets to use the hallway? Another analogy would be a road, right? Who gets to um, to send information or send things down the road? So you say you have a bunch of cars on a, some kind of a special one-way road um, that only cars from one road are allowed to be on at a time. And so how do you decide? You can't just put a car out there, right? Because then you'll ru they'll run into each other. On a computer, we can do that because when they run into each other, we don't care. Well, okay, we'll back up. They do care. You do care, but you don't care a lot, right? Because it only was a fraction of a second, and so we can just go ahead and rebroadcast it and figure out how to do that. That's a really fascinating stuff. I, I encourage you all to look up how, how buses actually are handling um, some of that transfer. Like, who, who has the right to do that? I think maybe I did talk about that a little bit before. Okay. Control module. So those control modules can be of, of different types. In the in the CPU or in the host, because we have to say in the host because what what we're saying is outside of I/O, so main memory or something close to it. Uh, but not, not at the drive itself. So it might be on the motherboard, it might be on the CPU. 
it, my guess is probably it'll be in the motherboard. That's what will be the circuitry. Or, and then there's also other ones in the peripheral. So the peripheral is the thing that you're plugging in. And so the structure of our computers, at least when it comes to PC, uh, yeah, so... Let me talk just for a brief moment about the kind of the difference between a Mac and a PC in some ways. So on a Mac, and that includes iPhones, iPads, all, all the different Apple products. They control everything. So they control the, the how the memory works. They control how the hard drive works. They control, so you have to buy, a, like if you're going to use a Macintosh most of the time, at least a lot of the internals, you have to, like you have to get a keyboard that's specifically made to be used on a Macintosh. Uh, there are some ways to kind of work around on that, but um, so they're designed to work, everything's designed to work together. So a lot of times it works better together, but... You have to go to Apple to get your things. So if you want a new mouse, you need to go to Apple to get it. Or you have to get one that's specifically made so that it will work with the Apple. A PC, not the case, right? So it's 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 a free-for-all in a lot of ways. Um, the, the good news is they've really standardized a lot of things, so you don't have to worry about it as much. But... Uh, in fact, you probably don't have to worry about it at all, but you, that, that is, uh, where, where we run into, we can run into some problems there. Okay. Uh, interfaces to external... components i.e. a keyboard or a mouse or uh, a presentation clicker uh, it could be to a monitor although it's probably maybe not that but so and we'll talk a little bit about what that what does it mean to be an interface uh, does it fit in here, or do I talk about it now? So, an interface is... Maybe I should talk a little bit about... Well, we're going to see an example of control modules. So, a control module is a chip that goes somewhere that's going to do things, and I think interface probably is going to be um, a little piece of hardware. Not a hardware, sorry, software. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, because like a driver is an example of... Uh, an interface, or it's the idea of one. So for those of you who know about that, you can kind of understand that. So then also we can have cabling or other transfer media. Like Wi-Fi. So, right, because if you have a Bluetooth that's connected to your computer, that's still considered a peripheral. And so the Bluetooth technology would actually be part of the input-output subsystem. Okay, so... Oh, why am I yawning? I shouldn't be yawning. That's not good. Okay, let's... Um, then, then let's let's talk about. I'm going to talk about. I think four, maybe five, five different systems. Oh, yep. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, when two things need to talk to each other. Oh, okay. Wait.
Yeah, okay. So they have to decide on a way to do this. And so this is where actually the, the analogy for from, um, from a Mac or a PC comes in. Is that we have to decide, they have to decide on a protocol that they're going to use. So a perfect example, this is a perfect example, right? I have my mouse. This is my Logitech mouse. It's a wireless mouse. It's paired with my wireless keyboard. I use it for everything I do. I prefer the mini buttons and the scroll wheel and all that kind of stuff, but that's all personal preference. Okay, so this, this can work for a PC or for a Mac. I'm pretty sure this works for a Mac. So because of that, it also, I could plug this in, right? It has this, this little, this little plug in. I'm not going to take it out because I probably reset my computer. It's, it's a weird system. So, but it has a little thing that's properly called a dongle, right? That's, uh, it's, it's plugged into my computer currently. And it's what takes the information from here and takes it to the computer by, through a uh, wireless. It's Wi-Fi. Uh, mine is not a Bluetooth. So what it's so I'm I'm pretty sure that it, it will work for either. So what happens is it inside of here, if I took this thing apart, I don't even know where you would take it apart. There's even screw spots. Oh yeah, there's a screw spot there. That's it, huh? huh? Maybe that's enough. Who knows? Anyways, I've got an old one. Maybe I can take it apart next time. That'd be kind of cool. So if I take it apart, there's a bunch of there's a computer chip in there. That's that's in there, and that has software to be able to handle the two different protocols or multiple different protocols, right? Because what happens if I have a Linux computer? Would this still work? Maybe. So. That's what a protocol is. A protocol is, it's like a system. Well, what does it say here? Uh, the exact form and means of the signals exchanged between a sender and receiver is called a protocol. So I'm gonna call it a communication system. I think you could just as easily uh, you could just as easily say it's a data transfer system. Um, I would I would say those two things are, would be synonymous. So it's it's the the system with which you're going to use. So whatever that is, that's called the protocol. Okay. So the next one, which is very important, is a handshake. I know I'm just kind of defining some terms here, but but um, these are these are good terms to kind of get a decent understanding of what this means and how it, how it goes. So um, a handshake is when the the two pieces that are sending information between each other that they agree on, on a protocol. So this is this is the agreement. On protocol. So the first thing that happens when you initialize your my mouse when I first plug it in, it has to, it communicates with something inside the computer that then decides, okay, well, how are we going to communicate from now on, right? It notices it there. It says, well, how do we figure this out? And then it decides what protocol it's going to use, and then it creates a handshake, so both of them agree. So it's just like, you know, maybe people don't do it nowadays, you know, right? If you're signing a contract, right, you would sign the contract. But in, for some people, right, it is a legitimate way to do business, is you, you, you shake hands that you will both agree to do that. And that's where that analogy comes from.
and then buffers. I don't know if I'll use these anymore, but so buffers are. Oh, okay. So this is memory. Memory uh, used to to transfer data. So that's it's not a perfect. Well, okay, it's not perfect. So let's actually get a def definition of buffer. Computer buffer. Uh, oh, a buffer is a data area, memory, shared by hardware devices or program processes that operate at different speeds or at different types. Da, da, da. A buffer allows each device to process or operate without being held up by the other. So, <clears throat> cache is a buffer, is a mid uh, midpoint holding place, but exists... Not so much to accelerate as, okay, right. Uh, in terms, this term is used in both programming and in hardware and programming. That's, it's different in programming. Buffering sometimes implies the need to stream data uh, from its final intended place so that it can be edited. Yeah, okay. So, uh, or, right, when you're watching a video, it might buffer that video. So this is a different word for a buffer. This is a different meaning for that. So what we're talking about here is a place for memory that can be accessed by, in this case, both the I.O. device and some part of the processor, uh, rather that CPU or, or some specialized circuitry. I'm going to say I.O. data here. Okay, it's a couple terms, although I don't know that I'll use them too much. All right, my purple here. Oh, what do I, one, two, three, four, I have five different ones. So we'll go over those five and then, then we'll... Okay, the first one is called a programmed I.O. There are different protocols that are used, or actually different styles of protocols. This is done strictly on the um, on the device itself. So it consists of two parts a bit with two parts so I'm gonna call I'm gonna say a single bit and so uh, what would that um, um, no 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 yeah um, okay control bit A control bit and a data byte. It's very small. All right, so the control bit one is has data. Zero, no data.
So what happens is the processor pulls this control bit every so often has some kind of a timer or whatever it is, doesn't matter. It, every once in a while, it's just going to look at the control bit in the, in the uh, I.O. And it's going to say, do you have anything for me? 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 And it waits until, and, and, and here I've said one is data and zero is no data. Those can be flip-flopped. It doesn't make a difference. Functionally, they'll work exactly the same. So but it's just going to look at that one bit. And as soon as it sees a value there that it's looking for, it's going to go, okay, now I'm going to retrieve the data from the, from the data byte. And it just brings that in. in and puts it wherever it decides to put it. doesn't actually change the system. So really super, super simple one. Um, not, not terribly complex at all. Right. And I think if I'm not, I, I might be, I might be correct at this. I'm not positive. Uh, programmed IO is used by keyboards. They're it's really, really good use for, for a keyboard because how many keys are on the keyboard? Enough that we can store the data in one byte. Maybe. I'm not sure. But it's a pretty small number of keys, right? I'm looking at my keyboard. I'm going, it's probably less than 100. Well, there's 256 different possible keys or uh, key combinations. Maybe. Well, when you start getting into Alt and Control and Shift and, and, uh, and those because those are always combined usually with others, and sometimes it's Alt-Control and then something, or Alt-Shift, or Control-Shift, or uh, and it, or maybe you have to do all three. So, although I don't know that there's any that I can think of that do all three, but, uh, right, you could have different ones that are kind of going at the same time, so they have to be able to fire together. Who knows? Um, well, there is somebody who knows, right? The people who make the keyboard. All right, so, uh, but that's, I think, th I think keyboards are an example of this. We could probably do a mouse being an example of that as well. Just, right, remember, like it's, I said, it's polling that, right, every so often. But that every so often could be 10 times a second. And that in computer world is like a really long time apart. All right. So the next one is interrupt driven. So this is very similar to the programmed IO in that it has a data byte, but it doesn't have a control byte. Um, actually, can it do more than, it can, it can do more than, than that. Nope, nope, it doesn't, it's just one byte still. So it has a, a data byte. Man. It simply has a data byte. Except the difference is, in a programmed I.O., your I.O. device, whatever it is, doesn't have the ability to ever communicate. It can only answer if, data, if the data byte is asked for. That's the only thing it's allowed to do. In an interrupt-driven I.O., what it what it does is, as soon as it fills the data byte, it generates an interrupt. And if we remember back, an interrupt is a thing that comes into the stream uh, that, that, that stops the running program, potentially, right? The, the, there's tons of exceptions to everything. But, but it, it comes in and it interrupts the current program and stops or pauses at least the computer program to deal with itself. Or it, 
at the very least, it puts itself in a queue, right, first in, first out, so that, so that it will be handled as soon as there's a pause in whatever's currently running on the CPU. Okay, so it, 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 in, it, it uses this interrupt that it sends to the CPU that then the CPU then knows that there's a byte of data in the data byte. And so it can then go out and fetch that. So it's just a difference between who has the control, right? Is the, is the processor always asking or are we waiting for the interrupt to be sent? Now, th there's advantages to both uh, because in one place the control is centralized, which is good. In the other one, uh, but it's wasting time, right? If it doesn't get used very often. And so that that's a problem right so we potentially could have an alert there the the or a, a, just because you're wasting all this time asking uh, an interrupt driven one we're not wasting time asking but if we have a lot of data that's coming in from that place we have to deal with interrupts constantly and interrupts are far harder to deal with than a control than pulling a control bit All right, so the next one is memory mapped I.O. So what this does is this reserves, there's a reserved block, and this is a little different than the block we talked about last time for memory, right? We talked about blocks in memory. So this is, uh, let yeah, let's let's not do a block a reserved. Uh, I'm going to call it section here for lack of a better word. What I mean is just a group, just a, a, a bunch. We don't know how much. It could be a lot. It could be a little. It, it depends on the system. Reserved section of main memory. And this would be used as a buffer. Actually, I'm going to cross out the word main. Because it doesn't have to be main. It's just some memory somewhere. So... Um, what it will do is it will put the data bytes that it needs to put into the I.O. into this buffer. And that could be main memory or it could be some other kind of memory. It doesn't matter. Um... And then the um, um, the system notices that that stuff is there. Now we could use an interrupt or or polling, right? Programmed. 
um, system, but it's different in this case because it's it's internal, and so it's going to check internally instead of something far away. So it doesn't take a long time to make that check. It's much quicker because it's now in main memory. Or I could actually set a register. We'll get to that. <laughs> oh yeah, that's another one. So it reserves a section of memory, and it's just going to look in there to see if there's anything there. If there is, then it goes ahead and brings that in. And it knows, because of its location, that tells it where it comes from. All right. None of those are terribly common. So then the next one... direct memory access or D M A and my capitalization game is not very good here all right so Uh, so this uses a special chip to handle I.O. So let me draw a, a simple example here that hopefully will make some sense. Okay, we have a CPU I'm going to call this main memory, but I'll just write memory here. That'll be enough. So DMA is down here. So interface, and then and there's another one down here, so we can have more than one. It just, just denotes that there's more than one. Oh, there's a printer. It could be other things. And this right this interface is probably right in there. All right, so I'm going to use a different color here to denote here. So oops. This is an address bus. But this address bus also has a connection to the DRM. I'll switch to blue. Two lines there. This is the data bus. And the data bus is connected to the CPU. It's connected to the DM, 
A and it's connected to memory. Yep, correct. So there's a direct connection between these two, and that's called the control. So it can pass controls back and forth on this line between the, it's direct control. But it doesn't send data on down this line. It's going to send the data down the bus. Okay, one more here. And I know I'm doing them different directions, but they, the, the fact that I'm doing them different directions doesn't matter at all. It's only to try to make this. So this is the I.O. bus. And the I.O. bus is connected to the DRM DMA and to both of these interfaces. So and this is a good way to kind of talk about what an interface is too, right? It's this thing between the printer and the bus, in this case, if it was more direct, it might go straight to the memory or it might go to the CPU or whatever. It doesn't matter, but it's something that's going to translate from the printer to something inside of the host or the computer. And so this here, this is the interest part, this DMA, this, this is a processor. But it allows all of our peripherals, our disks, our, our hard drives, USB drives, whatever it is, anything that's external from the computer or deemed an input-output device, the DMA, the direct uh, memory access, this is going to control that. So if the CPU needs something from the print needs to send something to the printer, what it can do is it sends the information to the DMA. And then the DMA decides when to send it out to the printer. It's probably pretty quickly, but you don't know. So the advantage to this is that we can have, because transfer across these buses is slow usually to the different things, to the disk or the, to the printer, so we can have a, a buffer inside this DMA that's big enough to kind of handle quite a bit of data so that it doesn't, so we don't have to worry about it getting, you, the, the CPU can just send out the message and it can let the, the DMA handle the slowness. That, that's a, the best way to kind of think about it, right? We've got this specialized chip that's going to deal with things being slow because the, the reading and writing from, from external is very, very slow compared to how fast the computer. Wait, actually, what did I, did I make a mistake there? No, I did not. Okay. I was thinking this red one didn't, didn't have much to it, but... Okay. Oh, yeah, that's actually really cool. All right, so let me talk about the very last one here. And I'll do it talking with... with The last one is a channel, channel I.O.
Okay, so here's the difference. It's a little different. It's not tremendously different, but it's a little different. This again is memory. I guess I could have put the CPU here, but I'm going to put the CPU down here. This is the memory bus. Oh, that's different than what we talked about before, isn't it? Because we had an address bus, a data bus, and an I.O. bus. Ooh, okay. How's this different? Well, this is different because this, instead of just being for address or just being for, for, um, for data, what this is, it doubles, it doubles both of those two together. And so what this is, is it's a bus that allows the CPU to communicate with the memory and other things. Oh yeah, what's the other thing? In this case, we they call it a bridge. I-O bridge. We could also just call it a, a I.O. controller potentially as well. And that's connected here as well. So it can communicate as if it's memory. So it acts to the CPU like it's memory in a lot of ways. All right, so then over here we've got this. Actually, let's make it green so it's consistent. Here's our I.O. bus. Now, I.O. processor. Or I.O.P. And so this might be a printer. Or maybe Ethernet card. Oh, we need to connect these. But then there's another one here. Could be another I.O. processor. I'm going to call this just an I.O.P. So that could be your hard drive and your second hard drive. And then you plug in a uh, a little a data drive, a USB drive in, so that'd be another one that'd be can called a even we call it a disk even though it's really not. Sometimes we do anyways. And so I can just say etc here as well. Another IOP and it can have some others connected to it. And potentially Right. Yeah. So potentially we could kind of split this a little bit and and say we're going to set pass it off to an IO processor which is not directly connected to any of these devices. So then well uh, no I think my guess is we probably are going to have it Right. Yeah, because every plug-in that you have on the computer, right? You look on the back of the computer or the side of your computer, and you've got these plug-ins. All those plug-ins are assigned to an a, a, a IOP, and those then that knows how to handle the protocol for that thing. Presumably. We hope. <clears throat> yeah, perfect world, right? Okay. 
Uh, I think I'm going to stop here. Um, that's a pretty good uh, section, although I, I probably should be just a touch more here. Um, but we'll we'll talk about kind of how how the uh, IO bus works next, and then. Um, and then look at some different ways to transfer data over over these buses. Oh, actually, this is good stuff. Oh, including disk technology. Ah, this is great stuff, man. This is way more than I thought would be here. So, okay, good. All right. And DVDs. Huh. Question. Do you use DVDs anymore? I don't know. I never really did, so... Uh, uh, I think I maybe own more VHS tapes than I do DVDs. But I'm just old, so it's fine. I'm trying to think how many DVDs I own. Maybe four? I don't know. Not very many. <laughs> uh, everything I do is pretty much streaming. So uh, there's a negative side to that. Uh, it came up actually recently for me. Uh, there's an old game, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's a fairly simple game and a lot of people didn't play it much, uh, but it was on Steam, and I bought it, man, like eight years ago, and I play it, almost every, not, not necessarily every day, but once in a while, I'll, I'll boot it up and I'll play it, and the games don't take very long, it's just kind of one of those things you can do, you know, when you're just wasting a little bit of time or trying to decompress or relax. So, uh, but in the last few months, they took it off of Steam. I couldn't access it anymore. So I paid for this thing on Steam. Uh, most of you understand this, right? But it could be any other service out there, um, not just Steam. And then the publisher of that product, right, could be a movie, it could be a game, it could be whatever... Uh, so let's say, um, well, I go to uh, Apple Tunes, iTunes, and and I buy um, a, a a song, right? And I because I want to listen to it. And but then later on, the person who controls the copyright for that comes to iTunes and says, eh, I don't want it on your platform anymore. So now my purchase, what I bought, I no longer have access to anymore. So there's a there's a bad side to it as well. These services are really, really wonderful, right? Because it allows you to get electronic copies of things, to use electronic copies of things at, at, uh, at, at a lower cost than it would be to, to get it on a hard copy, right? So like when we did DVDs or CDs, right? If I wanted to buy a movie, uh, you know, the movies could be $50. And that was quite a few years ago. And I don't know if they were that high, but 30 or 40 bucks, they'd come out on the DVD. Um, but, but you don't do that anymore, right? You can just go online, you can rent it, or you can buy it. But the caution... With buying it is, if that platform, whichever platform it is, right, it could be iTunes, could be Amazon, whatever it is, if they no longer have access to it, now you don't have access to it either, even though you bought it. So just, I'm, my guess is most of you understand that or know that or have run into it before, but I'm just throwing that out there. And I'm not trying to knock any of these places at all. It's just, it's a it's a potential danger. Now, the good news is, for this for this legacy, this old game that I've got, is I already had it downloaded on my computer. And since uh, they had already done an update on it that didn't require you to be on the internet in order to use it or be on Steam in order to use it, uh, Steam wouldn't activate it. At first, they actually pulled away the that ability but then i went i had an icon that was on my desktop so i went to that icon and opened it up i was able to run the program locally and then steam recognized it so that it knew that it was okay so 
there was a workaround at least in that case, so I will give Steam credit for actually being able to handle that, which was very nice. Uh, but I don't think if I didn't have it downloaded on my computer, I would be able to get that back. I wouldn't be able, to, even though I did purchase and pay for that. Well, maybe it was free. I don't even know. Maybe it was free, and that's part of the thing. So, I I have also yeah. Anyway, okay, um, that's all I have for today, and we'll talk about the rest later. Uh, no class on Thursday. No assignment this week. Nice little break, but remember, remember, okay, that. When we come back, you know, we, we take the break. Don't get used to the break. <laughs> uh, we're gonna come back and we're gonna we're gonna hit the ground and we're gonna keep running. Uh, and we do get another break when we get to Thanksgiving, and, and that will be a little bit longer. But for our class, I don't think it, anything changes. It's just a one day. So okay, that's it. I will talk to you all on Monday. Have a good rest of the week and your weekend. And uh, yeah. My company has a mental health day on Monday, so I'll be taking a mental health day, but I'll be I'll be teaching you guys. I'll be doing that video on Monday. So, okay. All right. Talk to you later. All. Bye-bye.